Welcome back. This is session two on the perfect 10, God's core realities for life. About the 10 commandments, what Hebrew calls the 10 words, or better, the 10 realities. This is the third commandment, the third reality, the name of God, the infinite God. Let's go back over what we've learned. The first commandment is about who God is is who we've already seen him to be. It's knowing God and his power, love, and grace. It's what, not what we've done, it's what he's done. And knowing that allows us to choose him completely. Have no other God. To love with our whole heart. First, God. Then that one-hearted love can be applied to people and friends and community and family. Single-hearted love. And this means that we can fully trust in God today. Out of his faithfulness, we have faith. You see that in Hebrew. Faithful and faith are both emuna. They come from amen. What is faithful? So, because God is faithful, we can have emuna in him, and we can become emuna faithful to others, to him and to others. As we learn his faithfulness, we have faith. As we become faithful, others can have faith in us, and that changes every relationship. In biblical Hebrew, the Ten Commandments, are numbered with the first 10 letters of the Aleph Bet. And they're used to number the 10 commandments. The third commandment, reality, is you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now there are words in here in English sound like one thing, but in Hebrew, have a different meaning or a different flavor. And these words are crucial to understand this reality. The third reality is how we take God's name, how we see it, understand it, and knowing it, knowing his name, we now actively live his power, love, and character. In the first commandment, we have seen who God is through his past actions of power, redemption, and love. For Israel at this time, it was being taken out of Egypt. It had just happened. For you and for me, it's when God met us, when he brought us out of bondage, when he was there for us. We need to go back to who he has proven himself to be for us. It starts off with him, not us. I am the Lord your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house or the family of bondage. He loved us first. This reality is about seeing who he is through his proven actions. The first reality is not about you or me. It's about God. He is the one who's delivered us. The second reality teaches us to love and trust God with our whole heart. The third commandment is about knowing the name, which means the character, core, and heart of the infinite God. And the reward of the payback that when we know and understand and act follows in our life. When we remember that God has already delivered us from bondage, we will experience the benefits of God. This is not a lack of trouble, but his power, grace, and purpose in both the good and the bad times, especially the bad times. In the good times, seeing the awe of who God is keeps us from walking away from life and love and relationship and truth. In the bad times, it matters even more. 
Now, when I grew up, there were times of beatings. And after the first hundred beatings, the physical wasn't a problem. I could walk through it. I knew it. I could do it. But after that physical beating, I'd go out to the doghouse and sit in the doghouse with my dog, who would love me completely. And I sat with my dog, and I sat with Jesus Yeshua. And I knew his reality. And I've had a gift from that time on. I do not question the reality of God and his love. I know it. And all that I went through to get there was nothing compared to the gift I was given. To know who God is in the hard times makes the good and the bad completely different. In Hebrew, there are three heavens. The heaven, the skies, the birds fly in, the space that stars are in, and the third heaven is the presence of God. And in the Garden of Eden, when they turn their back on God as their God, trusting and loving him, that delightful place of Eden was no longer delightful. Paradise without the relationship with God was a place of shame, a place of hiding. But in the worst situation, think of Corey Tenbrum, Richard Wormbrand, go down the list. People who knew the presence of God in the worst time have a gift that we can all be jealous of. Do not look for bad times. But when they're there, don't waste them. Get the benefit. You're already paying the price. Benefit is seen in the Hebrew letter Gimel, which is used for the third reality and means benefit. The letter Gimel became our letter C and G. Here's how. Ancient Hebrew Phoenician became the early Greek, the archaic Latin, and our modern letter C and G. The ancient Hebrew Aleph Bet became our modern alphabet. Gimel became our C and our G, and you can see how it became the modern Hebrew letter. Gimel's main tells us its meaning. Gimel means Gamal. Vows change all the time in Hebrew. It means a natural reward or requite. To ripen for good or bad. God's benefits, the good, are the good harvest that follows God in our life. The ancient Gimel is the picture of the head of a camel. And here's why. Because Gamal or Gamul, benefit, became Gamal, camel. A camel was the clear image of the reward that follows effort and relationship. Camels were also called the ships of the desert and carried the goods and treasures that built fortunes and empires in the ancient Middle East. It is a natural reward as seen in Isaiah 18.5. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, gomel, ripening, a sour grape is bolser. The solution to sour grapes is ripening, gomel, or the benefit that comes when the work is done. The full benefit will be made very clear in the next webinar when we look at the fourth reality, which is the day of Shabbat, the Sabbath, or the day of God's rest and restoration. In the same way that sour grapes become sweet, hard times can become God's rest. Remember, he was saying this to Israel coming out of bondage. Life-changing benefits are the natural result 
of following God, as seen in Psalm 103 too. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his gamul benefits. The benefit of knowing and wholly loving the infinite God is that I can trust him to be all that I need now in any circumstance. He rewards Gamu all those who love him. This reward begins as we embrace the second reality. Here's how. Deuteronomy 5.10 says how when God responds to us by showing tender, loving mercy for a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. Remember, we can never outlove God. The ten realities ripen into rewards or benefits when we know and walk with God. And the perfect ten warn us, as do all realities, of the pain that naturally follows when we turn away from and reject God. This is not God punishing us. It's the requite, the natural negative result of trying to live without God's power, love, and grace. Knowing the infinite God and his benefits will lead us to rest, renewal, and restoration that is found in the fourth reality, which is our next session. There are six key words that are different in English than Hebrew that we're going to look at to help us understand and receive the benefits of God. Take, carry, that's one word. Name, Lord, God, vain, guiltless. Let's start with take or carry. Nasah means to take up, to lift up, receive, or to carry. And this applies to our calling out to God, using his name, and carrying his name as his people. We take on his name like a family name, like a husband and wife take on each other's name. We carry, we take and carry his name. Nassau, you need to know this, is not a Hebrew word, but it's the primitive verb form used by Strong's and other Christian scholars. In modern Hebrew, they write it nun sheen aleph. In English, it would be n-s-a. And the vowels are added to that to come to all the forms and tenses and everything else. The sa is the foundation everything's built out of. To call on the name of the Lord. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joel 2.32, Psalm 5015, Jeremiah 33, 3, Zechariah 13, 9, and in the Greek New Testament, it continues it. Acts 2, 21, where sozo means safe and whole. We're not just safe, we're made whole. To carry his name in how we live without hypocrisy, keeping our covenants with God and each other, never vowing with his name falsely, not misusing his name, and really, because we understand his name, never saying his name without extreme awe. Imagine sitting in the presence of the infinite God. How could you do anything else? When you see him for who he is, how would you pronounce his name? In the New Testament, it talks about the people who call themselves by his name, but don't live it. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good or excellent work. Titus 116. Because God will not hold innocent, free, or find guiltless those who carry God's name in vain, many Jewish scholars consider the worst sin as doing raw 
or evil in God's name. And we'll come back to this later. This is a crucial concept. Take, carry, name, Lord God, vain, guiltless, the six words. Let's look at name. The name. Shem or name in Hebrew describes the nature or the essence of a person or thing. Unfortunately, when Shem is translated into English, we lose the depth of what it means to name a person or thing, and therefore we lose some key life precepts that the Bible teaches, foundational truths that could transform our brokenness or not even sin. Now, I grew up on Indian reservations. I'm not tribal, but I grew up there. And one of the things I learned is in the tribes, names mean something. It's not a sound. It's an identity. It's who they are. And every one of my tribal brothers and sisters, friends, I just grew up thinking of as brothers and sisters, could tell you their first, middle, and last name and what it means. And we don't understand the blessing and the curse that we do when we name people. And we'll talk about that soon as well. The name comes from Sum, Shem comes from Sum, which means to put, ordain, place, or direct. According to the Jewish virtual library, in Jewish thought, a name is not merely an arbitrary designation, a random combination of sounds. The name conveys the nature and essence of the thing. Shem in Hebrew means, means the name, reputation, or authority. Names not only describe who or what, but also the purpose, future, and relationship of what is named. Shem is used for fame or reputation. It is who others see us as because of our actions. But this is more than just our reputation. It's who and what we are. Our name ordains, places, and directs our lives. And in a good sense, this describes who you're called to be, who God's called you to be, who you are, who he sees you as. In a bad sense, we often name each other with curses, worthless, loser. You can finish it. But if you want to see somebody's heart open, call them by a name of value. Use their name with honor. I can tell where a married couple is simply by listening to how they say their spouse's name. With anger, hurt, or with tenderness and awe and love. How we say a name, how we call them, tells us the relationship. How we use their name tells us the value and the relationship given. On the negative side, Shem describes the core of a person. Proud and healthy man. Mocker is his Shem, his name. He acts with arrogant pride. Proverbs 21, 24. The essence of a proud and arrogant person is seen in the name Lutz, mocker, or scoffer. It's who they are. Because English names are much more about the sound than the meaning. And that's not true around much of the world. Ask somebody who's Chinese what their name means. From India, what their name means. They know what it means. They're just not used to telling us because we're not usually interested. We often miss the depth of what Hebrew means when it speaks about God's name or even our own name. The biblical, by the way, I have a book called Written in Stone about the new name God gives us, the new identity, future, purpose, and relationship that he's going to give us. And the old name we need to turn away from. The curse that God does not want us to have is often found in the name that others have given us, the name we put upon ourselves. The biblical Hebrew name defines the character, power, and purpose. And here are some examples. Chava, or Eve, means life. David means beloved. 
Saul, Shaul, means asked for. They asked for a king, and then they weren't happy. They got what they asked for. Moses, Moshe, means drawn out of the water. That happened when he was a child, and he brought Israel out of Egypt. Job means the hated one. In contrast, Satan means the adversary or the enemy. Daniel in Hebrew means God is my judge or protector. A dog in Hebrew is kalev or all heart. Is there a better description of a dog or a kalev, which means dog? And Jewish lore says he was called a dog because he fought ferociously like a dog in battle. And the Bible says he had a spirit for God like no one else. Read Numbers 14, 24. He fought and loved with all his heart. Yeshua, Jesus means salvation, or Yah, God saves. God is called Hashem, or the name. And this describes his power, love, and character. He's more than a name. He's the name. The Hebrew word picture for Shem, name, describes the infinite God as Sheen Mem. Sheen is a picture of sharp teeth and symbolizes to devour or destroy. Mem is the picture of the waves of water and symbolizes often chaos. Twice in the Bible, in creation and in the flood, water symbolizes overwhelming chaos. Think of a tsunami. Nothing can stand against it. Shem, or name, is what destroys chaos. The name of a person or a thing, the character, nature of something, answers the question. The name defines the character and the story. God's name fits God's character, power, and heart. He is the creator of life. He, like nothing else, destroys chaos. On page 832 of Gesenius, we're told that some scholars consider Shem name as having come from Shema, or hear. Shema means to hear. It also means to understand and therefore obey. And I believe that Shem name, Shema, hear are directly related. Let's start with the word picture for Shema. Start with name and add ayin, which means an eye in Hebrew. The ancient form of this letter shows the picture of an eye and symbolizes to see or understand. An eye is a powerful biblical image. For instance, a person with a good eye is generous, and a person with an evil eye is a stingy, mean person. He who has a generous eye, tov ayin, a good eye, I will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Back to Ra. Remember Ra? Evil? To do evil in God's name is the worst? A man with an evil eye, Ra Aim, hastens after riches. He doesn't see people. He sees money. People don't matter to him or her. In biblical Hebrew, what is in our eye means how we see and judge something. It's used to describe good, evil, hard, or to give grace. How and what we see changes us. The eyes used to describe grace, pity, envy, pleased, displeased, pride, generous, and greed. And this changes even how our struggles same to us. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they were in his eyes as single days because he loved her. This is carried into the Greek New Testament, Matthew 6, 23. But if your eye be evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness to hear, understand, and obey is to see the name. If we see God, the infinite, powerful, loving, kind, 
merciful, just God, when we see him, then obeying changes. Let me explain. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's hot. I've been here in 122 degrees, 50 degrees centigrade. And if I were to walk to your house in that heat, walk miles or kilometers to your house, and I got there and I'm dying of thirst, and you welcome me in, say, Frank, come in, make yourself at home. But I have to leave for an hour. My house is yours. Anything you want except that glass of water on the counter. Don't drink it. Now, if we're good friends, if we're close friends, I'm going to think, ah, they love me. They have to forgive me. And I'll drink the water. But if you tell me, Frank, that's the glass we use to clean out the sewage. Don't drink it. Once I see the name, once I hear with understanding, I'm going to obey. Suddenly, obeying is no longer about limitation. It's freedom, an action of profound wisdom. God is Hashem, the name. To see the name is to see God, see his character, nature, truth, love, grace, mercy, justice. And we'll come back to this. Remember that name in Hebrew is Shem, which means name, reputation, or authority. When we take and carry his name, we do all of that, which is why we have to be so careful with it. Take, carry, name, Lord, God, vain, guiltless. Let's look at Lord. Anytime you see Lord, all capitals in the Bible, it refers to God's name. Y-H-W-H in English. Lord is used 6,519 times in the original Hebrew scripture. Hebrew tells us a lot about God's name. At the core of the word in Hebrew, that is God's name, is a clear Hebrew concept. Hava or Hawa in Hebrew means to breathe, to live, to exist. It comes from an onomatopoeia, what a sound that becomes a word. Say Hava out loud, and you can hear the sound of breathing, living, existence. And the letter Yud in the front to the right of the Hebrew word Hava, and you spell God's name. Yud means hand in Hebrew, and as the ancient, and the ancient Hebrew shows the picture of a hand. It's the Y in Y-H-W-H, or God's name. The meaning of this letter can be seen in Yad, the Hebrew word for hand. Yud symbolizes to make, to create, power or to hold. The picture for God's name says that in his hand are life, breath, and existence, or he creates life and existence. Is there a better description for the infinite God in his hand are life, breath, and existence? That's why I like Hebrew. Let's look at the word for God. The usual word for God in Hebrew is El, which means a strong, mighty, or hero. El can apply to God, people, and even the strength that we might turn to instead of God, false gods. El is used for the real God. May God Almighty, El Shaddai, bless you. By the way, go to my video teaching, A Mother Rose Up, and, and you will see a teaching on Shaddai. That's a crucial concept. El is used for power. It's in the power in the, of my hand. It's in the El of my Yad. El is used for powerful leaders. I have delivered him into the hand of the mighty one 
Nebuchadnezzar of the heathen. El is closely related to the words for an oak tree, a ram, a male goat, a strong post, or mighty men. Whatever we turn to for strength or leadership becomes our God. And here's the word picture. The first letter, Aleph, is a picture of the head of an ox and symbolizes what is first or strong. Aleph in Hebrew means an ox or a bull. We get our word elephant from it. The next letter is Lamed. Lamed means a shepherd's staff in biblical Hebrew. The ancient letter was originally the picture of a cattle goat or a shepherd's staff, and then it was turned over upside down, and then it became modified. Let's go back to God, L. We can read these letters. The Aleph and the Lamed became our A and L. The Aleph have the sound here of E. So you can read L. God, L. The word picture describes God as the first or the strong shepherd, controller, teacher. This is true for the real God. It's also unfortunately true for whatever we turn to as our first strong shepherd, teacher, controller, for good or bad. Money, power, approval, control can all be false gods. Even good precepts and goals can be terrible gods. Truth, purity, safety, and even hope can and have led to self-deception. How many good things end up twisted? Think of the Inquisition. Think of people wanting to do things, to have things done right, and they control and manipulate, thinking the goal is worthy of the actions. But the God of the Bible is more than just strength and control. His purity is not a stopping, it's opening up to life. El is used for the real God. May God Almighty El Shaddai bless you. Elohim is plural and would normally be translated in Hebrew as God's, but when used for the God of the Bible, Elohim is singular because all the verbs are in singular form. In the beginning, God, Elohim, bara, created. There is only one infinity. But infinity is not singular, it is plural and singular and plural. Is there a better way to describe infinity? Plural, an infinite number, but there can only be one infinity. In the beginning, God created. God is plural, created is singular. God is infinite. But who's able to build him a temple since heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Take in, measure, hold, or contain. He's beyond space. Space and the universe cannot contain God. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite, literally without number. You take the biggest number, he's un his understanding is beyond that. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable, without or beyond searching. The finite cannot understand the infinite. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. The everlasting God, the Lord, everlasting, perpetual, or hidden, unknowable by anything finite. The creator of the ends of the earth, he created the edges and beyond that, beyond anything in the earth is him. And beyond the universe is him. 
He neither faints nor is weary. Everything finite slowly wears down. He's infinite. He's no weaker today than yesterday. His strength does not diminish. His understanding is unsearchable. Anything less than infinite is not God. We've seen that God's name describes him as the creator of life and existence. That his name defines his character, power, and nature. That he is the infinite God. Now let's look at the word guiltless. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now in English, it sounds like innocent or guilty, but there's a twist to it. Guiltless also means free from a vow. Naka means free, clear from wrong, therefore innocent, or free from a vow. And I believe that both meanings are involved. Exodus 27 is the third time that Naka is used in the Bible. The first two tell us everything. You shall be free from my oath. You'll be free clear from my oath. If we remember that the second covenant, second commandment, is a covenant vow to God, that we choose him alone and there can be no other. Just like a marriage vow, we take on his name. To take his name as empty can mean to turn away from this covenant. But just as with the marriage vow, turning our back on the vows on the covenant does not give us freedom. Ask any spouse who has been cheated on. We are free when we fulfill the vow to God, to friends, to our spouse, to our community. This is the core of loyal love. Let's go back to Shema, or here. Two key verses follow the Ten Commandments, follow the Ten Realities. And the strongest verse uses Shema, or here. And it uses God's name twice in this verse to describe him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength. With all your heart is with the core of who you are. All your soul is the nephesh, the fulfillment in life. Your purpose, your life, and all your strength is literally all your muchness, all your very... If I got this much strength and I go to the end of it, that's all my strength. It's to the end of what I have. This should apply to God, to friendships, to marriage. We stop before our strength ends. To see the name of the infinite God means that we will hear, understand. And because we understand, act and obey. Let's look at the word for vain. We're going back one. Shove. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Let's look at the word vain. It's the opposite of God's name, character, nature, and reality. Vain in Hebrew is shav, which means empty, vanity, falsely, evil. It's related to the word show or showa, which means devastation, storm, and is the word used for the Jewish Holocaust. Sheen, Vav, and Alev. The picture of each letter. Sheen is sharp teeth. It means to devour or destroy. Vav is a nail or hook. It means to secure, to hold together. Alev is the head of an ox. And is what is strong, what is first. Vain, Shav, Shoa, destroys the nail, the security, strongly. Together they draw the picture of Shav as what is empty, vain, 
false devastation. And like a disastrous storm, it destroys the house, the crops, the barn, people. It leaves empty destruction behind. It's empty and desolate. When something has nothing to it and nothing's left there, that's shove. In this word picture, God's name, his character, his power and love are what hold together and secure life. Your life, my life, our lives. So to get rid of to get rid of God's name, his character, who he is, to not see it as the core of reality, is to walk into a life of devastation. We take God's name in vain when we speak of him as empty instead of infinite, contrary to his nature, character, and reality. We take God's name in vain when we use his name to destroy or do evil, contrary. We take God's name in vain when we speak of him as empty instead of infinite, contrary to his name, character, and reality. Or when we use his name to destroy or do evil. Or when we use his name to lie, deceive, contrary again to his name, character, and reality. He is life, love, truth, grace, salvation, and redemption. We take God's name in vain. and We do not stand up to the destruction and holocaust that are in our time. Again, these are contrary to his name, his character, and his reality. The opposite of the infinite God is empty, destruction, evil, vain. God's name is built around a clear Hebrew word and concept. Hava or Hawa in Hebrew means to breathe, to live, to exist. Again, say it out loud. You can hear the sound of breathing. The picture for God's name says that in his hand are breath, life, and existence. Is there a better description? of the infinite God? We know the benefits of God when we become, when we become fully ripe, and the sour grapes of our life become sweet, when our bondage becomes our promised land. The third reality opens our hearts, lives, and future to the next reality, because the benefits of knowing the infinite God allow us to enter and live in his rest, which is the next webinar. To enter his rest, renewal, and restoration is a peace that comes from wholeness. Be sure to watch for the next teaching session on Reality 4.